Welcome to the Final Frontiers radio show, where we spotlight inspiring missionary endeavors around the globe. Stay tuned to hear how you can personally get involved helping the Lord's frontline soldiers effectively advance the gospel where it has never been preached before. In this episode, we'll have Final Frontiers representative David Jemansky back with us telling a missions trip story from Africa. And we'll have a very unique biography of a special national preacher in India who is also a leper. Hello, this is Joshua Martin, and today I have my sister. She is Aurora Dover. She's uh, the wife of Jason Dover. We've had him on here before. We've also had Rory on here before, too. We call her Rory in my family growing up with her. Um, she was talking about the message that she had out at the boot camp that one time. We tried to record that and put that on here. But I'm actually at the Beyond Borders boot camp right now, so you'll hear birds in the background. We are in the camp. We are trying to find a secluded place to be able to just talk for a little bit. We've been training people for two and a half, some weeks now out here, all kinds of experiences going on. And I've just gotten my sister off to the side a little bit. I want her to retell the story that she had told me. And I also, Jason had told me over the phone when I was praying for her, I was praying desperately day after day. Uh, for my sister when she was in South American jungle and a medical emergency came up. So, Rory, could you talk about that? Could you tell that story to us? How did that all start? All right. Well, uh, one night, midnight, I woke up just sicker than I've ever been in my life, and uh, I, I couldn't go back to sleep. I had this horrible pain in my side, but there's there's no medical help in the middle of the night there, so mm. we're just going to wait till the morning. And finally, the morning came. We, we drove into... Pichinaki and or we hiked and to you Pichinaki, hiked in. <laughs> yes. Got a taxi uh, Hard to down get the hill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we went in and uh, to a clinic that we had been before and they went ahead and did an ultrasound since I had such this terrible pain in my side and they saw that there's some kind of problem in there. They thought maybe it was an appendix and they could see some fluid around it, so they thought maybe the infection. Um, but we also found out that time that I was also pregnant. And mm. so they suggested we go to a, a larger city and maybe get some more work done. Maybe I need to get my appendix out. And so we went back to our home and we packed up some clothes in case we were going to have to stay in the hospital and drove another uh, about hour and 45 minutes in another taxi, crazy taxi rides, real <laughs> fast. And <laughs> It is wild over <laughs> there on crazy. those roads. People die all the time. Yes. I mean, just going right off the road. Yes, they do. But uh, at, at this point in time, I just still feeling real sick. In that first clinic, they had tried to lay me down. I couldn't lay down. Um, I found out later that uh, my chest cavity was filling up with blood, and it was freezing my diaphragm. I could not lay down yeah. at that point. And we got in that taxi ride. We went to that bigger town, and they were going to try and do some surgery because at this point they're still thinking appendix. And their anesthesiologist was out of town on vacation so they weren't going to be able to help us at that clinic there's another there's a hospital another uh, 10 15 minutes away and they suggested we we tried there instead at this point my whole body had gone numb even my face i could feel couldn't feel even the tip of my nose anymore everything was just numb i felt like i was going to pass out and i just kept thinking if i can just stay awake i can survive this i just can't fall asleep mm. and we uh, got another taxi, and this one was really crazy because this time my husband was telling him, come on, we got to go fast. This is bad because I was in really bad shape at that point. And we got to the hospital, and it took about a half hour for him to take us seriously. And we finally got in to see a doctor, and they were filming uh, a video in the room, the examining room. And they're just sitting there filming their video, and they went to take a look at me. And, and this is just really bad shape at this point. And we finally, they finally decided to go ahead and check me out. They did another ultrasound. This time they said they thought maybe it was eptopic pregnancy. I was pregnant, two different spots. Mm -hmm. And so they'd have to, to fix that and maybe be able to save the one baby. So by the time I actually was able to go in for surgery, I had been bleeding out inside for 18 hours. Ah, we're, it's got to be a slow bleed. It it's was a slow bleed. Slow. When they got done, they told me that um, I had lost half of my body's blood and so it really it was a slow bleed thankfully it was a slow bleed for all the time it took to be able to get the surgery done mm. once I was at the hospital it was still another two hours before I could even get in to the operating room they gave a list to my husband of instruments and things they would need for the surgery and so he's running around town to all these pharmacies trying to get these things and 
it was to even start the surgery because they don't have the stuff they need there. They ha- they send people out to buy it. I can remember him calling mm-hmm. and talking about some of this stuff and just to hear that here he is. You're in an operating room and you can't even begin. Yeah. And you're losing blood. That's just crazy. I, he was telling me he was just running hard on the streets, pounding the streets as hard as he could to try to find the stuff that mm-hmm. was needed and anesthetic and everything to even put you down for that. It was Right. If you don't have family there, you're out of luck in some cases because yeah. they have to get everything you need to do surgery. So once we got, we got through that surgery, thankfully, they told me that what had actually happened was that I had a cyst the size of a golf ball that had ruptured. And mm. um, so that was causing me to bleed out. At this point, I was still pregnant, but since they removed the cyst, they were supposed to give me some other medicine for the baby to stay alive, but uh, we couldn't convince them that that was needed, and so was not able to receive that. So we did end up losing the baby there. Mm. But their equipment, their medical knowledge is on such a lower level in the states. Um, you know, in the states here, it would have been a simple surgery to go in and, and fix it, but here they had to cut you all open, and there's a lot of medical trauma that resulted from that surgery and just post-trauma from the whole surgery itself. There's a lot of things that happen during that whole time of you know, knowing that, that you're dying because you mm-hmm. can feel it. You can feel that you're dying. And so, so thankful, praising God, when I woke up and I was still alive. A few weeks before, uh, about a month before, I'd gone through some difficult things there in Peru, and God had given me some really special verses Mm. three verses out of Psalms that I had written down on a three by five card and I carried around my purse when we were driving in that taxi and that crazy ride and I was sitting in that clinic and I couldn't feel my body anymore and we were in the hospital and no one would see me and I knew I was dying I had that three by five card out and I was just reading over it and there were special promises to me about that God was going to protect me and I had such peace going into that surgery I was laying on the table. They had taken my glasses, you know, for surgery, and I couldn't see anything, but I could see all these people around me and stuff. And I don't know if I was singing out loud or not. Maybe it was just in my head, but Mm -hmm. the only song I could think of was Little is Much When God is in it. And Mm -hmm. the verse about when you're weary and wounded and you can still be in the battle and the place of prayer. And that was the only verse I could think of. And I was just singing that, and God just really blessed me with peace. And I could look back on that time period and see how he protected me and all the circumstances were against us after that surgery I don't know how many doctors I had tell me that I should have died Mm -hmm. I had lost so much blood they wanted to give me a transfusion and because they couldn't get any more blood out of me to (laughs) to test it see if there's infection and see what's happening and they wanted to give me a transfusion they decided to wait till the next morning thankfully and by then it was just a miracle God had raised my hemoglobin level back up high enough that they didn't have to. And that was just a miracle because you don't want to get a transfusion in a third world country. No, so dangerous. Very dangerous. God sent this elderly lady who's a nurse there who the very first day they had me trying to get up and stand because it was a similar surgery to C-section, but more of an abdominal surgery. So they have you get up trying to get you to walk around. I was not doing well at all because they wouldn't give me any pain medicine they were confused that um, I was allergic to something. And so I was given no pain medicine Mm. after my surgery. So I was in pretty bad shape. And this lady came in and she's like, oh, you need to get up. And I was like, I'm I'm trying to walk around this. And she took me in a shower. She helped me take a shower. And she had me get back in bed. And and she's like, I want to do your hair. And she braided my hair and combed it. And just all the time she put into it was so sweet. And it was a blessing. It really built my spirit up because that night was was a rough night. They gave me some medicine in case I was getting an infection. And they gave me two doses, which they're not supposed to do. And I had a reaction to that and I could not breathe. And thankfully, I I had a little cell phone with me and I was able to get a hold of my husband. And I told him, you got to come in here. The nurses will not help me. They're having a party in the other wing of the building we were in. Um, It was a maternity ward and all the ladies different stages of labor or had babies we were all in the same ward just laid out in beds and the nurses and doctors were having a party on the other end and and they would not come help me and I was having such trouble breathing I didn't know what was going on and so I was able to get a hold of him and he came in and he was able to get him to come over and there wasn't really much we could do except pump through liquids and try to get that medicine out of my system and 
everything. The next morning, thankfully, we were able to move me to a different clinic that was able to take a little bit better care. Still wasn't able to get that pain medicine, but <laughs> eventually. So right after the surgery, ward, they did not give you pain medicine? Did not. Um, not for at least four or five days after the surgery. That is insane. Until I had, that's, that's amazing. And yeah. you get into these places. When she says that they went to a bigger city, you're talking about, mm-hmm. this is La Merced, right? Yes, La Merced. So this is not, <laughs> there's this little pocket here of San Ramon <laughs> and La Merced, and these are still village. This is on the other side of the Andes Mountains. This is on the jungle side. So these are not big cities. You can't mm-hmm. imagine. It's, I mean, Lima is the big city, or Cuzco is the big city in Peru. These are small, small places. And they actually, they had to wash you out on the inside and all of that. Yes. Wash your intestines. That was so much Took blood that you had lost. Washed them off, put them back in. And you're yeah. dealing with this in a third world country where mm-hmm. you have no painkiller after yeah. all of that is just amazing. And, the, and so they put you in this maternity ward. I can remember where I was praying. I was praying mm-hmm. that you would not die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, can remember, I can remember the room I was praying in and where I was sitting and where I got down on my knees and I begged God and and just, oh, it was really an emotional time being mm-hmm. a world away and not, not knowing what's happening and just praying for Jason to have wisdom. Mm-hmm. It was so hard on us. <laughs> yes, I can imagine. Yeah, you were in that maternity room and I remember you telling me that you prayed for those girls in there. Mm-hmm. The nurses gave them such horrible advice about how to take care of their children. They lose so many of their, their infants, and it's not mm-hmm. a wonder why their medicine is so poor over there. And it's so sad to listen to, and that's really on my heart to be able to go back and go into these maternity wards. It's such an opportunity mm-hmm. to go in, and you can visit these ladies during their visiting hours, bring them a little bag with a track in it, and some things, essential things, like you're not going to have toilet paper unless someone brings it. You're not going to have soap unless someone brings it to you. Bring a little bag with some of that stuff and hand it out to these ladies in there and get a chance to witness to mm-hmm. them. They would be so grateful, I know. Yeah. And it's such an opportunity to share the gospel with them. And so I could just see God working through that, allowing me to have this experience so mm-hmm. I could go back and be able to be a witness to these people. It really gives you a heart for those those mm-hmm. people. These are all tribal people yes. that are in the jungles there that come into these hospitals and go through this. Who knows even if their husbands are there, you mm-hmm. know, or even going to pick them up. Yes. Who knows what they're going through. No one's married over there, hardly hardly ever. And so that a lot of them are going through everything alone. Mm-hmm. Or maybe a, a family member might be with them. But This is something I just want our listeners to hear, and I want you to be able to realize what... The missionaries go through what the what the wives of the missionaries are going through and their husbands are going through there and i just hope it touches your heart that you will think about this and that you will pray that it'll cause you to pray to get on your knees and pray for your missionaries you never know when an emergency like this is going to just come up mm-hmm. and if they are faithfully serving in a third world country it's oftentimes going to be in a place where there's no way they're going to be able to get to a clinic like you would know in the united states there's nothing there, and if they are lucky to have some hospital, it's not going to have what they need. And it's it can be just an incredible experience, terrible, terrifying experience for some of them. So pray for your missionaries. Pray about this. And thank you, Rory, so much for just sharing that today, telling us about it. In protected jungles around the world, there are still over 140 isolated tribes that have remained completely uncontacted. Who will reach them first? Loggers and oilmen with their guns or peaceful ambassadors of Jesus Christ bearing the good news of salvation? These last remaining dark territories on earth are extremely difficult to penetrate. If you are interested in partnering with us to help fund these expeditions, please visit us at finalfrontiers.world. Hello, this is Joshua Martin, and today I'm back with David Jemanski. He's in our offices today, and uh, David is a representative of Final Frontiers, and he's been here. We've been talking about the podcast today. He's actually going to be helping with the podcast, him and his wife helping doing some cutting and helping us with that. And so David's here today, and we were just talking about some of the things that go on on the mission field supernaturally sometimes. And I've done an episode before where I've talked about stories that have taken place to myself and... Uh, my co-laborer that goes out with me there and we've seen some things and it sounds like you've seen some things as well like when you were in Africa 
I've seen it in the jungles of Peru, and I've heard stories in other places. But I was wondering if you could tell us today for our listeners, sometimes we don't realize what our national pastors go through out there. And the guy that you were with had a genuine fear. T- tell us about that in Africa. Yeah, we were in one of the most pagan villages I've actually ever seen in Africa. Not only did you have the shrine in the center of the village with everybody pouring out the drink offerings at the idol, but when you would come into the village, you saw these beehive-shaped stacks of rocks with little mm. doorways in them. And come to find out that the purpose of those was so that the spirits of the forest would not enter the village, but they would go into those little houses instead of coming in. That's something, too. Like, even in Thailand, they have the houses that sit outside, the little bitty houses, and they put drink offerings there and food offerings and the bugs that get in in it and everything. But it's like the, the spirit of the property. Anytime you buy a property or you have a oh, business yeah. or whatever, you have to have the spirit house outside. It's a house or a business. It's amazing. And, and they so they think that the spirit lives in that house and they have to feed it. Mm. So that's similar, even in Southeast Asia. Yeah, it's same almost kind of thing. identical, yeah. And um, so spiritism was very, very real in that village. Mm. And then also while we were there, we uh, encountered a false prophet. He was a man from Ivory Coast who believed himself to be Jesus Christ wow. incarnate on earth. <laughs> so obviously Satan was heavily at work in this village. And um, when we left, there were four of us, our African guide who was from that village, my brother-in-law, my wife, and myself. Hmm. And so we began trekking through some of the densest jungle I've ever been in, the Takamanda Forest. It's a national preserve on the eastern side of Nigeria, western side of Cameroon. Okay. And as we were walking through this jungle, every so often we would hear these echoes. We would be stepping along and there would just be echoed steps. And so we'd come to a stop, listen, and we would hear crunch, crunch, silence. Mm -hmm. Just like the sound of something stalking us. So we'd start walking again a little further and hear the same echoes again, stop, hear the crunch, crunch, silence. Normally I would have thought that that was just an animal. Sure. But there was a sensation there that was, you could feel the presence of something, the, just an mm-hmm. evil, a, a sensation of fear. Yeah. And so myself and my brother-in-law, we actually started praying, in, in fact, silently. And just a few moments later, it was gone. So as soon as Didn't, you started praying, nothing was following you? Yeah. It, we stopped hearing the sounds. The, the, the sensation of that presence just went away. Mm-hmm. I'm convinced it was a spirit, it was witchcraft or something of that nature, but the Lord guided us there to take the step to pray, and uh, yeah. we saw deliverance from that fear. And the power of Christ, and the power of Jesus' blood, and Jesus' name, and it, 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 just, it doesn't stand up to that at all. And we've seen that, where as soon as we rebuked something, it was gone, completely gone. And I've talked about that on podcasts before. But this is something that they face in these places, whether it's a national or whether it's a missionary. I've got a guy here that I'm hoping to talk to soon where he can talk about some things that happened to him in Ghana. And it was just in his face, in his family's face. And they didn't know how to deal with it. You know, this is obviously, it's spiritism, and it's not something that happens in, a, in an American church very often. It does to some. I, I've seen it. But they're in the enemy's backyard. They're in his territory, and he is definitely going to make an attempt at an assault. But... Jesus Christ is much more powerful than that. The guy that was with you, what did he think? Did he think it was an animal or was he, was he afraid? He was very afraid. There was that and there were there was also elephants out in the jungle mm-hmm. and we lost the trail at one point. So he was very, very nervous the entire time. Uh, and he wasn't a believer, so I think that was a big part of that. Mm-hmm. And to see you guys get safely through was a good testimony for him. Mm, that's true. So what what are the elephants like out there? Well, thankfully, I've never met them up close, and I'm very <laughs> thankful for that. But they've got a very bad reputation of being very aggressive and very dangerous. Sounds like India. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everybody's afraid of them. You walk in the jungle. They're, that's the most thing that they're – that's the thing that they are most afraid of, that and tigers. But – yeah, there, there are dangerous animals in places like that, very much. I've heard stories of the old Cameroon jungles, mm-hmm. and I know how vicious, man, the things that would take place out there with the elephants and also with the gorillas in certain places. So you guys lost your way. God got you all the way through, even though the trail was gone. How did you get all the way through? When we got, we got to this one place where the trail just disappeared instead of the normal well-worn area where people walk through, it was just leaves, and they all looked the same. Mm -hmm. And our guide went back and forth this way and that way, and he couldn't figure out where it was. I know we were definitely praying inside, and uh, eventually the the guide got 
a good enough idea of which direction the trail should be mm-hmm. um, that we were able to, to continue on and eventually did find it again. That's awesome. <laughs> God protected you. God got you there. And you also got to see something supernatural where the Lord was more powerful than whatever it was that was sent after you to track you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, it's good. I'm, I'm glad. I hope people enjoy that story. It's good oh, to hear you. stories on here, mission stories. Thanks for coming today. Thank you. Is your church excited about missions? Do your people want to learn more about what's going on around the world in these last days? Does your youth department want to hear fresh stories about inspiring American and national missionary work? Or find out how your church can get involved in smuggling Bibles or reaching unreached people groups for a Final Frontiers representative to come and speak in your church services or missions conference. Please contact us at finalfrontiers.world. Hey, welcome back to Biographies. A lot of the folks who've been overseas with me to India have met this man. He's a pastor. He's a leper. His name is Dandapati Samuel. We actually have, well, I don't even know anymore how many leper preachers we have there in India, but uh, these are men who live in the leper colonies with the people. There'll be anywhere from a few dozen to a few hundred people living in a leper colony, and they need the gospel too, and usually they're not able to go to an outside church. So we have men who are lepers who've been saved, and they become the pastors to their own people. So let me read you his testimony. His wife, by the way, is named Suvarthama. He says, I was born into a family that was considered to be rich. I had everything. At the age of 24, when I was preparing for marriage, my father was also training me to help with the family business. It was then I learned that our wealth came from cheating people and charging high interest. When the poor people could not pay, my parents would sell their earnest and thereby gain greater wealth. After going to the doctor, we learned that I had contracted leprosy. My parents hid this knowledge from my fiance and her family so that they would not stop the wedding. In this way, they even cheated her. My two daughters grew up with us and became married. They loved me very much, but were ashamed to tell people that I'm their father. Already I had begun to lose my fingers and my face had changed. After they were married, I wanted to commit suicide. I was a non-believer in any God. At that time, some of my leper friends were going to see a pastor who gave them clothing and food. He said he did so because of the love of Jesus. After talking to him, I was converted. Ordinary pastors will not come to minister to us because we are forgotten by God and forsaken by society. Because I'm from a wealthy family, I had an education. So the pastor began to disciple me to become the pastor to the lepers. I have now led many of them to Christ, more than a hundred. My converts have a difficult time to be baptized because society does not want us to infect the water in the river. In spite of that, we find a way to honor our Lord. I also spend time training others for ministry to the lepers when I'm not begging on the street for food. God has surely blessed us with his mercy. So many of the lepers around me have now become believers in Jesus. Final Frontier sponsors have brought us food and clothing and even shoes that are made especially for us. We do not have a salary and my church members have very little to give, uh, only what they can tithe from their begging. Whatever you can do to help us survive and grow our ministry will be appreciated. Listen, this guy, I know him personally, I've known him for years, probably 20, 22 years. He's a tremendous guy with a wonderful heart. A friend of mine, Tim Ekno, who pastors out in... uh, Texas has uh, built a church for him and several other leper churches as well. I believe he actually built him a home not too long ago to live in. He said, Wait you, well, you've seen his pictures I've been reading. He's just as happy as he can be, a smile on his face. But it's more than just that. He's a hard worker. He has already led now over a thousand people to Christ and has baptized a little over half of them, 635 people he's baptized. So, so that means 635 lepers because no non-leper is going to allow him to touch them in order to baptize them. They think that the disease can be transferred by touch, even though it can't be. And he has helped to start a number of leper churches. We don't mind driving with him and taking them places. So we go and we find a new leper colony somewhere and he'll go and stay with them for a while, evangelize them, and begin training up a man for the ministry. So we've taken him now, or he's taken himself, to a total of 56 villages and helped to start 28 leper congregations throughout India. So he's doing a great job, and I guarantee you because of his disease 
and the expense in traveling for him that he could use more help. So if you're interested in helping him, send in an offering. We'll be sure that he gets it. Thanks so much. He'll appreciate it. Your inquiries and comments are important to us. If you have questions or perhaps subject matter you would like to have addressed on the show, please visit FinalFrontiers.world. Jesus not only gave us the Great Commission, He also gave us the greatest commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. The commission and the commandment are codependent. Before departing for heaven's glory, our Lord was surely aware of the welcome that was awaiting him. By whatever means heaven celebrates, whether it be cake or balloons or fireworks, you can be sure the angels had prepared a celebration unlike any they had ever had before. Christ was about to be received back in all his glory. The Son of God was going home. Heaven's darling was about to greet his Father and be adored by his creation. What anticipation he must have had. Yet at such a moment, he gave a departing order to his followers, one that would put the icing on the cake of his ministry. It was to go, to preach, to baptize, and to teach their converts to do likewise. And to be sure it would be done correctly, he left the task in the capable hands of those whom he loved and trusted, arranging for the very Spirit of God to anoint their ministry, just as he had anointed Christ. He equipped them, declaring that all the power he had used to create the universe was now theirs. By obedience, they would demonstrate they loved the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. And by evangelizing their neighbors and beyond, they demonstrated that they had the same love for others that they did have for themselves. The Great Commission and the Greatest Commandment are inseparable. If we love God, we will obey Him. If we love others as we love ourselves, we will warn them of their impending eternal doom and eagerly introduce them to the Gospel of Christ. But if we ignore His Great Commission, then we also ignore his greatest commandment. Our inaction declares that we choose to someday stand before God in disobedience rather than do without the empty desires of this life today. I'm John Nellis. To learn more about missions or a copy of my book, The Great Omission, on our website at finalfrontiers.org. You've been listening to the Final Frontiers radio show, funded by sponsors like you. Thank you so much for joining us. Through the funding of national and native preachers, we endeavor to effectively advance the gospel where it has never been preached before. If you want more information, visit www.finalfrontiers.world. That's finalfrontiers.world.